The sun who first had warmed my breast with love in proving and reproving showed to me the sweet and lovely visage of the truth. These are the opening verses of Canto Three of the Paradiso. Here we find Dante on the cusp of realizing the culmination of what he has been seeking as he enters a place where the guiding themes of his journey come together in their most fully realized forms. Three of these themes are evident in these opening lines, light, represented by the sun, love, and truth. After climbing up from the dismal depths of the inferno and the obscurity of the purgatorio, Dante is suddenly suffused with light. Having witnessed the tragic consequences of selfishness, fear, and loathing, he is surrounded and drawn in by irresistible love. And having witnessed the nearly impenetrable darkness of the mind afflicting the souls trapped in the inferno, he has come now to the realm where he is able to more clearly see the truth. Though even now he cannot see it fully, limited as he is by his human form. The limits of his earthly vision become clear early in the canto, when he sees several female figures whom he takes at first to be illusory reflections. He describes them as traces faint and weak, and doing the opposite of Narcissus who mistook what was false for what was real, he mistakes what is real for something false. Beatrice chides him for his limited vision and weak belief, saying, You're thinking like a child. No need to wonder why I smile, for you don't dare to trust your steps to truth, but still go toddling back to empty thought. Dante's mistaken perception is a consequence of his still human form with all of its limitations in apprehending spiritual truth. The issue of limited sight is a consistent theme throughout the Divine Comedy, and as Dante progresses on his journey from the Inferno to the Purgatorio and finally the Paradiso, his sight becomes more and more clear and he is better able to see the truth. This is in line with the biblical saying in 1 Corinthians 13, 12, where Paul explains to his Corinthian readers, For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know, even as also I am known. As the fog clears from Dante's mind and he understands that he is seeing real people, he turns to the woman who seems most eager to speak. She urges him to search his memory so that he can recall who she is, explaining, I was a virgin sister in the world below, and if you peer into your memory, I am Picarda, blessed with all the blessed who dwell within the slowest of the spheres. As with most of what Dante writes, these few lines speak volumes to us about the human condition. At issue here is the human capacity for memory and the centrality of memory in making us who we are. Picarda begins by urging Dante to peer into his memory. The importance of remembering and the tragedy of forgetting are reinforced over and over throughout Dante's journey. The many departed souls he meets are often desperate to be remembered in the world above when Dante returns to his life there. In addition to the horrible punishments they endure, the damned of the inferno are in anguish at the knowledge that they have often been forgotten by the living, consigned to a second kind of death, the death of their memory, as well as their honor and good reputation. Memory is also central to the entire enterprise undertaken in the Divine Comedy. Dante, the literary figure, is meant to remember everything he is seeing so that he can take the lessons back with him and make them faithful in his own life as well as in the lives of others who are still living. In a similar way, of course, Dante, the writer, creates this fantastic and moving tale as a way for generations of readers who come after him to vicariously take the journey with him and to call to mind who they are as human beings, enfleshed souls whose lives here have lasting consequences for their eternal existence. St. Augustine's insights also help to illuminate the beautiful and sacred aspects of this human faculty of memory. In Book 10 of his Confessions, Augustine writes movingly about the centrality of memory to the construction of the self and the life of faith. He explains, I rise by degrees unto him who made me, and I come to the fields and spacious palaces of my memory, where are the treasures of innumerable images, brought into it from things of all sorts perceived by the senses. There is stored up those things which the senses have perceived and whatever else has been committed and laid up which forgetfulness has not yet swallowed up and buried. 
When I enter there, I require what I will to be brought forth, and something instantly comes. Others must be longer sought after, which are fetched, as it were, out of some inner receptacle. Others rush out in troops, and while one thing is desired and required, they start forth saying, Is it perhaps I? These I drive away with the hand of my heart, from the face of my remembrance, until what I wish for be unveiled and appear in sight out of its secret place. Great is this force of memory, excessive great, O oh my God, a large and boundless chamber. Who ever sounded the bottom of it? Yet is this a power of mine and belongs to my nature, nor do I myself comprehend all that I am. In Picard's encouragement that Dante peer into his memory, we see echoed Augustine's meditations on the awesome power of memory as a gift, which is like a spacious palace from which we can call forth what we need at the proper time. Augustine also provides the insight that I myself do not comprehend all that I am. This applies to Dante's realizations in Canto Three, as he comes closer to the ultimate source of light and love and, in doing so, is better able to see the fullness of who he has been created to be. His challenge will be to carry this memory back with him to earth, so that this fullness of his being in God informs the way he lives out the rest of his life. If he can do this, then rather than remaining lost in the dark woods of midlife, his journey will have equipped him to get back on the path that leads to his fullest, most fruitful life. Picarda goes on to explain why she and the other women are placed in this furthest and slowest circle of paradise when she explains, Because we were neglectful in our vows and left them empty in some respect, this place, which seems so low, is given us. There is important social and political context which explains why Picarda did not fulfill her vows as a nun. She entered the Order of St. Clair and, it seems, had every intention of living her life out there and fulfilling the vows she had made, but her brother forced her to leave and compelled her to marry a member of his political faction in Florence. As a young woman, Picarda would have had little control over her own fate in the face of her brother's insistence, but the failure to live out the fullness of her vow is nevertheless reflected in where she is placed in paradise. While we might think she would be unhappy with this placement, Picarda says, The Holy Spirit kindles in our breasts all we desire, for his delight is ours, and in his order we rejoice and rest. Dante, like so many of us, no doubt, is puzzled by her contentment. Unwilling to accept her self-reported happiness, he asks, But tell me, you who are so happy here, do you desire a place of greater height to see more, know more, and be held more dear? I see much of myself in Dante's question, and I expect many of us would harbor a similar sense of dissatisfaction about Picarda's contentment with her placement in the outermost ring of paradise, furthest from the ultimate source of light and love. In order to understand where Picarda is coming from, we must first attend to how she talks about her contentment and its source. She explains that her desires are the same as those of the Holy Spirit. Indeed, to be in paradise inherently means that one's desires are in line with God's. This is why she is content and why she says, His delight is ours, and in His order we rejoice and rest. This is a perspective most of us cannot fully identify with, so focused are we on our own will and desires, on advancing our own interests as much as possible. But we must remember that the inferno was filled with souls who sought their own way, souls who followed the devastating path to fulfilling desires that ran counter to God's will. So often, we think of our will and God's will as opposed to each other. I must wrest control over my life from God's insistence that I should do or want something else. This is a very modern way of thinking where our conception of happiness is individualized, and we tend to assume that to be happy is to fulfill desires of our own making. The fundamental understanding that drives the divine comedy, however, runs counter to this modern assumption and is in line with millennia-long understandings from antiquity through the medieval period that to be truly happy means to line up our way of being, thinking, and living with that higher reality outside of ourselves, which is truly good and beautiful. That is, this older conception of happiness takes for granted that we cannot define happiness and goodness individually. They are rather transcendent realities toward which we must strive and to which we must conform ourselves. 
It is the failure to do this which lands so many in the inferno or in purgatory. This is why, in answer to Dante's puzzlement, Picarda explains, Brother, the virtue of our charity brings quiet to our wills, so we desire but what we have and thirst for nothing else. If we should feel a yearning to be higher, such a desire would strike disharmony against his will who knows and wills us here. Here again. We moderns would insist, but how could you not desire more? Dante the Pilgrim answers us through his own realization by the end of the canto when he remarks, Then it was clear to me that everywhere in heaven is paradise, though the high good does not rain down his grace on all souls there equally. In his notes on this canto, Anthony Esselin provides an explanation that may help us to better understand what is going on here. He explains that the souls are like different sized containers, all of which are filled to the brim with all they are able to hold. Some containers are larger than others on account of the kind of life they lived, and so they have the capacity to take in more, while others can take in less. But nevertheless, each soul is filled to the brim with all they can contain. Canto 3 provides many insights for our lives today. How do we more fully orient ourselves toward light and love so that we can see more clearly what is true and good, rather than being distracted by the many lesser kinds of false gold that continually vie for our attention? What does it truly mean to be human, and what eternal significance do our lives and the way we live them hold for us and those we love? These are weighty questions that take a lifetime to address. But Dante has given us a torch to light the way forward on our quest. Oh.